In 1916, Ezra Taft Benson, a humble teenage farm boy from Whitney, Idaho, was hired by a local farmer to thin a one-acre field of sugar beets. Having a good idea of how long it takes to thin a field that size, the farmer figured it would take the young Benson boy several days to complete the job. Apparently, the farmer didn't know Ezra Taft Benson very well. Starting at sunup, the 16-year-old worked furiously throughout the warm spring day. And by the time the sun dropped below the rugged horizon, the determined farm boy had finished the job he set out to do. In amazement, the farmer paid the boy two $5 gold pieces and two silver dollars. Ezra's hard work had paid off. Later in life, while serving as a leader of one of the nation's largest agricultural organizations, Ezra spoke of hard work to a group of farmers. Like most farm boys, I grew up believing that willingness and ability to work are the basic ingredients of successful farming. Hard, intelligent work is the key. Use it, and your chances for success are good. Throughout his life, President Ezra Taft Benson evidenced a reverence for his faith, his family, his freedom, and his farming. And he proved that each of these was worth any amount of hard work or sacrifice. As a devoted husband and caring father, a national farming executive, a member of the president's cabinet, and a modern prophet of God, President Benson exemplified the success that results from hard, intelligent work. In the year 1638, John Benson, an English immigrant, became the first ancestor of Ezra Taft Benson to set foot upon the fresh soil of the American colonies. Arriving in Boston, he soon acquired a stretch of land in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and began the long-standing Benson family traditions of harvesting the fruits of the soil and preserving the liberties of a young and faithful nation. In 1811, in the settlement of Menden, Massachusetts, John Benson, Jr. and his wife, Chloe, gave birth to their first son. The boy was named Ezra Taft Benson, the Taft being Chloe's maiden name. He was, however, known by most as Ezra T. Benson. President Benson's great-grandfather was Ezra T. Benson, also Ezra Taft, but he went by Ezra T. And in fact, when Ezra Taft Benson was called to be a member of the Quorum, he was asked specifically to start writing his full name to avoid confusion through church history. But Ezra T. Benson was a convert to the church, and at one of the first sacrament meetings that he and his wife attended as they were investigating the church, a fight broke out over the sacrament table. And Sister Benson turned to her husband and said, well, what do you think? of these Mormons now. His posterity will be forever grateful for his response. Ezra T. Benson turned to his wife and said, I think the church is still true in spite of its members. He saw beyond the human imperfections <laughs> and saw that the gospel was perfect and worth joining. And he joined the church, becoming the first apostle called by Brigham Young. After settling with the saints in the Salt Lake Valley, Ezra T. was directed by Brigham Young to preside over the saints then settling in what is now northern Utah and southern Idaho. It was through this unique calling that the Benson family set down roots in the Cache Valley. George Taft, born on the westward trek, grew to manhood in this rugged western valley, as did his son George Taft Jr., the father of President Ezra Taft Benson. And in this same quiet valley, George Taft Jr. met Sarah Dunkley, the daughter of English converts, who in 1854 had made the arduous sea voyage and overland westward journey to join their fellow saints in Zion. During the young couple's courtship, George built a two-room home on a 40-acre farm in Whitney, Idaho. Before too long, George asked for Sarah's hand in marriage, 
and the two traveled south to Logan, Utah, where they were married for time and eternity in the temple on October 19, 1898. Shortly thereafter, the young Benson couple returned to their home in the peaceful Cache Valley, intent on raising a family in the one true gospel and crops in the dark, rich soil. Upon settling into their new farmhouse, George and Sarah Benson were eager to begin their family, and their wish was soon granted when on August 4th, 1899, a son was born. The birth, however, was a difficult one, as the baby boy weighed in at nearly 12 pounds. Thinking the baby would not survive, Dr. Alan Cutler set the child aside and concentrated on saving Sarah. Never losing hope, George quickly gave the baby a priesthood blessing. Then the baby's grandmothers, Margaret Dunkley and Louisa Benson, jumped into action. The two grandmothers took that baby, and as they worked and prayed, they put him into baths of hot and cold water, back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden, they heard a gasp and then a cry, and Ezra Taft Benson was alive. In the peaceful and picturesque Cache Valley, Ezra was quickly introduced to the values espoused by his ancestors of faith, family, freedom, and farming that would become so central to his life. When Ezra Taft Benson was a very little boy, in fact, it was about the time he was just starting to speak pretty well, his mother went to great effort to teach him some manners, and she taught him that when you meet someone new, you say, how do you do? and to use words such as please and thank you. Well, there's a great family story in which apparently the family was all sitting around this table to have dinner, and there was a big bowl of boiled eggs uh, in the middle of the table. Well, Ezra Taft Benson looked down on this bowl and said, well, how do you do, eggs? And the family just roared with laughter. Ezra, however, was not the baby of the family for long. When he was just 15 months old, a younger brother joined his family, and a little over a year after that, a baby sister came. In time, Ezra had six younger brothers and four younger sisters. As the oldest son on the farm, though, Ezra was quickly put to work. Almost as soon as he could walk, Ezra was laboring beside his father, caring for crops and managing livestock. He recorded, I drove a team when I was four years old, and not many years after this, I was riding horses to herd cattle. I learned early to milk cows. We had 17 Holsteins. This became and remained a major responsibility during my growing years. When Ezra T. was very young, he took part in the raising of crops and helped his father prepare the land for planting. Ezra T. grew on the farm, working with his father and brothers that came later because 10 more children came. Ezra Taft was our leader and we listened to stories from him as we worked as children thinning and hoeing and topping sugar beets. Ezra also learned the value of cooperative farming from his father. George would often combine his crops with that of other farmers to make selling simpler for the buyers who preferred to purchase one large quantity as opposed to many small ones. As an adult, Ezra would champion this idea of cooperatives for farmers across the nation. However, young Ezra learned more at the Whitney farm than just how to work the land. By his faithful mother and father, he was also taught to love the Lord and his restored gospel. Ezra also learned from his parents the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy. The Bensons worked very hard during the week, but Sunday was strictly a day of rest. On Saturday, each family member took a bath with water pumped from the well and laid out their nicest clothes. 
Everyone wanted to be ready early in the morning, as George was a stickler about being punctual at Sunday services. When it came time to leave, he called out one last time before pulling his wagon away, and those who were late had to catch up or walk to the chapel. One particular memory that President Benson had that was very tender for him is apparently he had been outside working on the farm and came in, and there was his mother at the ironing board ironing her temple clothing. And he asked a couple of questions about the temple clothes, and she set the clothing aside and took the time to talk to her son about the temple, about its sacredness and its importance. And he was very touched by that experience. Sarah also taught Ezra about helping those in need. While Relief Society president, she often had Ezra load a half bushel of weed into the wagon before she went visiting to aid families in need. Ironically, more than three decades later, Ezra, as an apostle, would deliver wheat and other needed goods to the European saints following World War II. On his eighth birthday, August 4, 1907, young Ezra was baptized and confirmed an official member of the church. Shortly after this special event, Ezra entered the Whitney School, where he learned reading, writing, and mathematics. Like most students in the area, however, young Ezra was released from school for a period in the spring and fall to help his father with the seasonal planting and harvesting. But whenever he could find time away from his farm duties, Ezra loved to read. He read success stories by Horatio Alger and the biographies of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. He also read regularly from the scriptures, particularly the Book of Mormon. No doubt his prophetic appeal to flood the earth with this great book was rooted in these adolescent reading sessions. Young Ezra also took an interest in music. He learned to play the trombone quite well, took piano lessons, and sang solos in the community and at school. Ezra was fiercely loyal to his brothers and sisters. And one day coming home from school, his cousin, George, was being unmercifully teasing to his brother. And Grandpa said, if you keep that up, I'll have to punch you out. Well, the cousin persisted in teasing. And so Grandpa got in a fist fight with his cousin, George. When Grandpa got home from school, he had a little blood on his shirt and on his fists. And his mother said, well, what happened to you? And he explained that he was just sticking up for his younger brother. And she said, I need you to go to George's house and see Aunt Lulu and get a start of yeast. And he begged his mother, please don't let me go. But his mother persisted, and he went down to the farmhouse to Aunt Lulu, and he learned the power of diplomacy and making things right. In Ezra's younger years, he learned about work, schooling, and the gospel, but he also learned how to have a good time. Once Saturday's chores were completed, the Benson family reserved the remainder of the day for family fun. Horse races, foot races, games, and picnics were regular activities. Family outings into the nearby mountains or to scenic Bear Lake were full of activities young T enjoyed, like swimming, hiking, and telling stories around the campfire. Clearly, growing up in the peaceful Cache Valley of southern Idaho gave young Ezra Taft Benson many rich experiences that would shape his character forever. Ezra knew he was no longer a little boy when his parents began leaving him in charge of the younger children when they were away from home. But Ezra's first real step away from boyhood came on a Sunday afternoon in the spring of 1912. One week, the bishop asked that all the children remain at home for church because there was an epidemic. And after the meetings, my father and mother went to the little store across the street to get their mail. And on the way home, mother opened the letters. 
One letter was from Box B, and it was a call for Father to go on a mission for two years. When they drove up to the gate, we all ran out, and we saw that both our parents were crying, something we had never seen. We had never seen a time when they were both crying together. And we said, what's the matter? And they said, everything is fine. Just come in the house and we'll tell you what we've learned. So we all went in the house and Father showed us the call that had come. And Father said, we've never been separated all these years and we know it's going to be hard. But Mother said, we're crying because we're so happy that Father has been found worthy to go on a mission. Twelve years old at the time, Ezra knew that he would need to help his mother through this time as he would now be the man of the house. By summer, George Benson, in the final act of sacrifice, sold a portion of the farm to provide money for the family in his absence. He then departed for his field of service in the Northern States Mission. Young Ezra learned quickly how much work his father had done. A man was hired to care for the 40 acres of crops, while Ezra was given full charge of caring for the family dairy herd and pasture land. Ezra's younger sister, Margaret, spoke of her brother during this time. He did the work of a man, though he was only a boy. He took the place of father for nearly two years. While George was still in the mission field, a smallpox epidemic swept through Cache Valley and all the Bensons became ill. As a result, their home was quarantined. With Sarah expecting, the doctor worried tremendously about her health and that of her unborn baby. He told Sarah she should ask George to return at once. But Ezra's faithful mother refused to take her husband away from the work of the Lord. In time, all the Bensons recovered from the illness, and a healthy baby boy was added to the family. He was named George Taft after his missionary father. We receive letters often from father, and when a letter would come, we'd all sit around the kitchen table and mother would read the letters. And the spirit of missionary work really grew in our home. And every one of the children have filled missions for the church, all 11. And some have filled two or three missions. After having served faithfully for nearly two years, George Benson was released in early 1914. He returned home to find that the Lord had truly watched over and blessed his family and farm. He also found that his son Ezra was no longer a boy. That same year, T graduated from the Whitney School, having completed his studies there in just six years, despite the time taken off during planting and harvesting. In the fall, he enrolled at the Oneida Stake Academy in nearby Preston, Idaho. The academy, the equivalent of a modern-day high school, was close enough that Ezra was able to remain at home and ride his horse to school each day. Calling on the resourcefulness he developed in his father's absence, Ezra started a small business venture related to his daily ride. In the morning, he set out muskrat traps along Worm Creek. On the way home, he gathered any trappings and took them home for skinning. The money he generated from selling the pelts helped pay for his schooling as well as other family needs. At his new school, Ezra took courses in science, biology, history, and mathematics, as well as religion, as it was a church-sponsored institution. His favorite classes, however, were agriculture, vocational training, and carpentry, because they would help him become a better farmer, which by now, Ezra knew he wanted to be. 
It was also at the Academy that T met Harold B. Lee, the future apostle and prophet whom Ezra would serve with for so many years. These two future church leaders even sang together in the school's first choir. While Harold excelled in debate, Ezra was a star basketball player. The squad traveled throughout the region, playing against other high schools and even some college teams like Rick's Normal College in Rexburg, Idaho. My father really enjoyed his years at the academy, but there was one experience that taught him a great lesson. He was taking an exam one day, and the lead in his pencil broke, and he leaned over to ask a student for a knife that sharpened his pencil, and the teacher accused him of Mr. cheating. Benson, Grandpa I felt very bad because he knew he wasn't cheating. He was being totally honest, but the principal didn't believe him, and banned him from playing in the basketball game that evening. He came home very disappointed that no one had believed him, especially the principal. And his father said, don't worry, T, everything will work out. That evening, he was called back from milking the cattle into the home where the principal asked him if he would play in the basketball game that evening. He played, but his heart was not in the game, and they lost the game. Ezra would never forget the frustration of not having someone take him at his word. He commented, it's the only time I can remember having my honor questioned. I did learn from the incident how important it was to keep my name above reproach. During his teenage years, young Ezra also continued to grow in the gospel. When President Joseph F. Smith counseled all church members to hold weekly family home evenings, the Bensons obeyed. And Ezra and his younger siblings took turns giving prayers or lessons, singing hymns, reading scriptures, organizing games, and making treats. Ezra also participated faithfully in the Aaronic priesthood quorums and had desires of serving a full-time mission when he got a little older. One Sunday at the Whitney Ward, two recently returned missionaries addressed the congregation. Ezra was so impressed with their message that he spoke to his father about getting a patriarchal blessing to know if a mission was in store for him. His father, of course, referred him to his grandfather, George Taft Sr., who had been the bishop of the Whitney Ward as long as Ezra could remember. After an interview with Grandpa, or Bishop Benson, Ezra met that very afternoon with the stake patriarch, John Edward Daly, and received his blessing. T was overjoyed at the promises given him of the Lord, most notably that he would serve a mission to the nations of the earth. At the age of 18, Ezra began what would become a lifetime commitment to scouting when he was called as the assistant scoutmaster for the Whitney Ward Troop. Having a knowledge of music, Ezra was asked to conduct the 24 eager boys in the Franklin State Choral Competition. After winning there, T's singing scouts were invited to a regional meet held in Logan, Utah, where they performed again. As Ezra prepared his young singers, he gave them a challenge. If they could win this regional competition, he would take them on a 30-mile hike to Bear Lake. Ezra recalled, They sang as I had never heard them sing, and of course, I'd not tell the story had we not won first place in Logan. True to his word, Ezra got the boys together to plan their trek to Bear Lake. As they did so, one of the young scouts suggested they all get crew cuts to make hair care on the trip easier. When Ezra and his troop arrived at the barber shop, the barber offered to cut all the boys' hair for free if Ezra would shave his head bald. Always a good sport, Ezra agreed. And shortly thereafter, a shiny-headed scoutmaster led the excited boys on a 10-day trip of hiking, swimming, and camping under the stars. Ezra T. loved every one of those boys, and they loved him. And he told me, I have kept in touch with every one of my scout boys 
And finally, every one of them have been married in the temple. That was one of his achievements. With the outbreak of World War I in Europe, patriotism and eagerness set in among the young men Ezra's age. And Ezra himself felt the desire to fight for freedom. Early in 1918, George and Sarah finally gave Ezra permission to enlist. He was accepted at the Reserve Officers Training Camp in Logan, Utah. In 1918, so many Idaho boys had uh, volunteered to join the reserves for the war that the farmers were concerned about their harvest, and so they asked the military officers if these boys could have a two-week furlough to come home and help with the harvest. Uh, Ezra Taft Benson was among those young men, and they received permission to have this furlough. But the day before they were supposed to go home, Ezra had a deep impression that he should go home a day early. So he got permission, and no sooner had he arrived home, and suddenly he was overcome with sickness and very high fever and was right flat in bed. And his father and grandfather gave him a priesthood blessing, and he attributes his life being saved to that priesthood blessing because, as it turned out, it was the flu. And great flu epidemic of 1917-1918 killed many thousands of people. The day after Ezra left the program in Logan, the day he was actually supposed to leave for home, the flu epidemic swept through the barracks. Both young men who bunked on either side of Ezra died as a result of the illness. One of them was his cousin, George B. Parkinson, whom Ezra had scuffled with years before, but who had since become a close friend. Ezra commented, Why should I get the impression to go home early on Friday? Had I waited, I would have suffered there with the rest of them and probably passed away. By the time the war ended in the fall of 1918, though Ezra had completed his training, he had not been called into active duty. He returned to Idaho and resumed his studies. In the spring of 1919, he graduated from the Oneida Stake Academy and returned to full-time efforts on the family farm that he loved so much. In 1920, it was common for people to end their formal education after their high school years, and Ezra could have easily chosen this route. However, at the Little Whitney School, he had a very influential teacher who, incidentally, was his great aunt, and she instilled in him a great desire to pursue his education beyond high school. And so he enrolled at the Utah Agricultural College in Logan. And while he was preparing for his studies, he and a cousin one day were standing on Main Street and noticed a sleek Ford convertible pass by. Ezra inquired who that beautiful girl was driving that Ford convertible. And he also said, I don't know that girl, but I'm going to marry her someday. And his cousin explained to him, like heck you will, she's far too popular for a poor farm boy like you. Several weeks later, back at the Whitney Ward, the farm boy was surprised to find Flora Amison visiting their Sunday school with his cousin Ann Dunkley. Following the meeting, Ann's father asked Ezra if he would mind taking Ann and Flora on a drive to nearby Lava Hot Springs. Needless to say, Ezra quickly got one of his siblings to do the afternoon milking and took the young ladies for a ride. In 1921, Ezra began his first semester of college in Logan. As his friendship with Flora grew, he decided to ask her to an upcoming school dance. When he called her, she explained that she'd already turned down several invitations because she had to serve as a student body officer at the event. But Ezra assured her that he wouldn't mind if she had to slip away occasionally, and she accepted. Their relationship was finally underway, and they quickly became very close. In the spring of 1921, Ezra received a letter from President Heber J. Grant, calling him on a mission to the British Isles. Putting his schooling and dating on hold, Ezra readily accepted the call and began to make the necessary preparations. On July 13, 1921, Ezra was ordained an elder under the hand of his father. And on the following day, 
he traveled to Logan with his parents to receive his endowments in the temple. Ezra was then accompanied by Flora and both his parents to Salt Lake City where he was set apart as a full-time missionary before boarding a train bound for Ogden with several other elders. Both Grandpa and Grandma had decided beforehand that she would not write him more than once a month, and he would write her only once a month, but they didn't want to write mushy letters. They had both seen elders who had a hard time staying on their mission because of the fact that they were longing for their loved one back home. With his party of elders, Ezra traveled by land to Montreal, Canada, where they boarded an English ship bound for Liverpool. During the 10-day voyage on rough, foggy seas, Ezra battled seasickness. His discomfort was eased, however, by a series of uplifting letters from family and friends compiled by Flora. He wrote, I had mail every day on the boat, and that was something. It was so nice to be able to open a letter out in the middle of the ocean. On August 1st, the Victorian finally arrived in Liverpool where they met their mission president, Elder Orson F. Whitney, who was a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles and the man for whom Ezra's hometown of Whitney, Idaho, had been named. President Whitney assigned Elder Benson to the Carlisle area of the Newcastle Conference in the northern part of England. At the time, anti-Mormon sentiment was rampant in England, and anti-Mormon literature had caused many to despise the humble missionaries. An unsavory film titled Trapped by the Mormons even portrayed the young elders as degenerates intent on luring women to Salt Lake City for immoral purposes. A whole month went by before Elder Benson sold his first copy of the Book of Mormon. Nevertheless, by the end of September, Ezra and his companion had three people prepared for baptism. In the spring of 1922, Ezra was transferred to Sunderland near the North Sea and called as conference clerk, which entailed a great deal of record keeping. He was also made branch president of the local church unit. Needless to say, he was very busy. In November, President Whitney was released and replaced by Elder David O. McKay, who was also an apostle. Elder Benson was greatly impressed with his new leader. He commented, He is truly a man of God. He said for us to hold our own and fear not man. Go with head up. We have nothing to be ashamed of. The world steps aside for the man that knows where he's going. President McKay likewise saw strengths in Ezra and soon called him to be the president of the Newcastle Conference, encompassing all of Northern England. While these assignments proved that Ezra was growing strong in his faith and developing considerable leadership skills, there were still lessons he needed to learn. By 1923, the anti-Mormon sentiment in Great Britain became very serious. Uh, president David O. McKay, who was a mission president at that time, issued a warning and gave instructions to his missionaries in various areas that they should discontinue holding street meetings. Elder Benson and his companion were located in one of those areas. Unfortunately, the two missionaries had already set up a street meeting and had previously announced the meeting place for the street meeting. So they decided this one last time they would hold this street meeting. And so by the Sunderland Railway Station in England, they began their meeting and began preaching. And soon a large crowd assembled and once the crowd determined that these were Mormon preachers, they became very hostile. Once the missionaries got separated from one another, poor Ezra, in despair, offered a prayer in his heart for the safety and welfare of his companion and himself. At that moment, a large man stepped forward uh, who had been there in the crowd and, and created some space in between Elder Benson and the angry mob. And he told Elder Benson that he believed every word that he had preached that day. It was at that time that Elder Benson saw Bobby off in the distance, who came forward and escorted Elder Benson and later his companion to the residence. Elder Benson never saw the large man again, but knew that he was an answer to his prayer. Ezra recalled, To my knowledge, it is the only time in my life that I did not immediately follow the counsel given me by my presiding officer. It almost cost us our lives. After serving the British Saints for nearly two and a half years, Elder Benson was released on November 2, 1923. Once again, 
Ezra spent much of his voyage home battling seasickness. He recorded, We lack the desire to do anything but heave and reheave. First we think we're going to die, and then we're afraid we're not. On the last leg of his journey home, Ezra stopped in Salt Lake City and received a blessing from the church patriarch, Elder Hiram G. Smith. In this unique and prophetic blessing, Ezra was promised that he would live unto a goodly age and would be held in honorable remembrance throughout the generations of time. On his first Sunday back home, Ezra gave his report to the Whitney Ward. As he stood at the podium, his heart jumped momentarily when he saw Flora enter and sit in the back of the chapel. In the weeks that followed, Ezra resumed his relationship with Flora, and he was almost certain she was the girl for him. When Grandpa was courting Flora, he was also being pursued by another woman who had written him many letters on his mission. So he asked his mother, which of the two girls should I pursue? They both like me and they're both nice girls. They came up with the plan. They said, let's invite them over with another friend of yours and meet with both of them at the same time. So the evening came around and Ezra's little brother came into the room and hit the floor hard and just started wailing in pain. Flora jumped to her feet, ran over to console the poor little brother, and she said, I hope you didn't put a hole in the floor. Immediately Ezra knew who he wanted to pursue. It was Flora. She was so tender-hearted and kind. Ezra's confidence in his choice, however, was soon put to a test of its own. After they dated for several months, Flora announced that she had been called to serve a mission in the Hawaiian Islands. Ezra was surprised, but supportive. He knew very well the importance of missionary work. On August 26, 1924, he rode with Flora on the train to Tooele, where they said their goodbyes for a second time. In his journal, Ezra wrote, We were both happy because we felt the future held much for us and that this separation would be made up to us later. It is difficult, though, to see one's hopes shattered, but though we sometimes had a cry about it, we received assurance from him who told us it would all be for the best. That same fall, Ezra and his younger brother Orville purchased the family farm from their father who had become heavily involved in regional government and found little time left for farming. As farm owners, Ezra and Orville hoped to make it as profitable as possible. To better market their dairy products, they even developed the slogan, you can whip our cream, but you can't beat our milk. The brothers also decided that higher education would increase their chances for success, so they agreed to alternate terms in school. Ezra headed first to Provo, Utah, where he enrolled at Brigham Young University, while Orville maintained things in Whitney. After trying the term alternation once, however, the brothers decided it was best if one of them got through school at a time. So Ezra returned to BYU with hopes of graduating before the summer of 1926. Ezra's intelligence, charm, and general charisma certainly came through when he was a student at BYU. Ezra was elected to be president of the BYU Agricultural Club and also the BYU Men's League Club and later served as chairman of the Senior Entertainment Committee. Ezra, I'm sure, was a big hit with the ladies at BYU as he was voted one year the most popular man on campus and later that next year was voted the most likely to succeed. Sticking to his plan, Ezra graduated from BYU in the spring of 1926. His outstanding grades and accomplishments during his time there had even earned him a research scholarship in agricultural economics at Iowa State College for that fall. In June, Flora returned from her mission to Hawaii and on September 10, 1926, Ezra and Flora were sealed for time and all eternity in the Salt Lake Temple by Elder Orson F. Whitney. Ezra recorded, The wedding ceremony was too beautiful for words. Everything went off so quiet and peaceful. It made us all so thankful for the restored gospel. 
Surely we had never been happier. After a lovely wedding breakfast with family and friends in the Hotel Utah, the young couple departed for Iowa State. The honeymooners traveled across the country in a beat-up old farm truck and spent all eight nights of their journey in a leaky tent Ezra had picked up in Whitney. Despite these rough conditions, though, the Bensons were at peace. The Bensons settled into a tiny roach-infested apartment in Ames, Iowa, and like most newlyweds, lived on a shoestring budget. Busy as they were with Ezra in graduate school, the young couple did squeeze in some time for recreation. One of the fun stories from President and Sister Benson's early married years is shortly after their marriage, they, they went to Ames, Iowa, where he was going to school, and many months had passed, and President Benson decided it was time for a little recreation. And so he reserved the tennis courts for a game of tennis. And he got probably the worst beating of his life, <laughs> not realizing that Sister Benson had been a first-class tennis champ at Utah State in Logan during his years in the mission field. After a year of diligent study, Ezra graduated with honors, earning his Master's of Science degree in Agricultural Economics. Once again, the Bensons packed their belongings into their Ford truck and headed to Idaho, stopping to see the countryside along the way. They also stopped at many farms to view firsthand some of the conditions and practices of farmers in different parts of the nation. In the summer of 1927, Ezra and Flora arrived in Whitney, where they ran the farm, while Ezra's brother Orville served a mission in Denmark. On January 2, 1928, Flora gave birth to the Benson's first child, a baby boy they named Reed Amison Benson. Ezra looked forward to the day his son could work on the farm with him. But little did he know that his time on the quiet family farm was coming to a close. After Ezra had been farming in Whitney for nearly two years, the county officials approached him about becoming the extension agent for Franklin County. Ezra accepted the county position with great enthusiasm as it allowed him to draw upon the farming programs and strategies he'd studied in college. The one downside, however, was that it forced Ezra and his family to move from the farm so that he would not be an active farmer in the county over which he functioned. As always, Flora took the matter in stride, and they soon established a lovely home in Preston. Ezra hired Kenneth Olberson to work the Whitney farm in his absence. On May 2, 1929, the Bensons were blessed with another little boy whom they named Mark Amison. Ezra and Flora were overjoyed. After 18 months as a county extension agent, Ezra was again recognized when the University of Idaho offered him a position as an agricultural economist and marketing specialist for the state of Idaho. This, however, required the family to move to Boise, as the department was located in the state capitol building. After prayerful consideration, Ezra and Flora decided to move again. They sold their share of the Whitney farm to Orville, who was back from his mission, as Ezra could sense that running a farm of his own was not what the Lord had in mind for him. In his new position, which he held for nearly nine years, Ezra traveled the state of Idaho, encouraging farm cooperatives and better marketing strategies. In fact, Ezra even helped Idaho earn its reputation for great potatoes. During their time in Boise, Ezra served in the Stake Young Men MIA program and Flora on the Stake Young Women MIA board. And for three years, from 1930 to 1933, Ezra also served as scout commissioner for the area. Unfortunately, during this same time, Ezra lost both of his parents. When Sarah passed away first on June 1, 1933, Elder David O. McKay visited the Benson family. Ezra recorded, Our father was bowed in grief, and ten children were weeping for the loss of mother. But Elder McKay completely changed the atmosphere in our home. He literally lifted us and filled us with hope. 
The sadness of the Benson family was renewed, however, when George died of a burst appendix just 14 months later. Their only consolation was the knowledge that their mother and father were reunited again on the other side of the veil. Both Grandpa's parents had passed away in one year, and George was out on a mission, and Grandpa took the responsibility of being head or patriarch of the household, and he had to be the bearer of sad news to George T. on his mission, saying that both his mother and then his father had passed away. Grandpa greatly admired his father and wanted to be a farmer just like him, and he loved his mother so dearly. She was a great confidant of his. In time, however, Joy returned to the Benson home. When Flora gave birth to their third child and first daughter, Barbara Amison Benson, on June 20th, 1934. In January of 1935, the Boise State Presidency was reorganized, and Ezra was called as the first counselor to Scott S. Brown. In 1936, Ezra received a graduate fellowship at the University of California at Berkeley, which took his family to Northern California for nine months. He was given temporary leave from his position at the Idaho State Capitol, while President Brown of the state simply refused to release his valuable counselor. At the end of his nine months, Ezra requested more leave from the state of Idaho, but was denied, and so he fell just one semester short of obtaining his Ph.D. In the summer of 1937, the Bensons returned to their home in Boise, and three months later, on September 20th, they were blessed with another baby girl, Beverly Amison Benson. The following year, Elder Melvin J. Ballard traveled to Idaho to divide the overgrown Boise stake. After three years of faithful service, Ezra was released as a counselor, only to be called immediately to serve as president of the newly divided Boise stake. Then, in January of 1939, Ezra was asked to be the new executive secretary for the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. The position, based out of Washington, D.C., was somewhat prestigious, as the NCFC represented over two and a half million farmers nationwide and nearly 5,000 cooperatives. With Flora in full support, Ezra traveled to Salt Lake to speak with President David O. McKay of the First Presidency before accepting. President McKay was also in full support, stating that the church needed good men in far-reaching positions like this. After Ezra's tearful release from his calling as president of the Boise Stake, he and Flora again packed up their little family and prepared to move to Washington, D.C. Prior to leaving, however, Ezra received a powerful blessing from Patriarch Matthias J. Benson of the Boise Stake. In the blessing, Ezra was promised, Though you will have many perplexing problems, if you place your trust and confidence in the Lord, if you take your problems before Him, the solution will come unto you. Arriving at his new job in Washington in the spring of 1939, Ezra immediately found himself thrown into the hotbed of politics. He testified before Congress, met with numerous government agencies, and traveled the country to organize and strengthen farmers' cooperatives. From 1939 to 1944, President Benson was the chief executive officer of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. That's the largest national organization of farm and ranch cooperatives in this country, and it was a very important position. It was wartime. And America needed more food and cotton and wool for our fighting men. He was a trusted advisor. He had access to the Congress, to the White House, to most all of those top-level government officials. The Bensons built a beautiful home in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. Having been in the region for less than a year, Ezra was stunned when elders Rudger Clausen and Albert E. Bowen of the Twelve came to Washington, D.C. They were there not only to organize the first stake in the East, but to call him as the first president of the new Washington, D.C. stake as well. Not long after Ezra received this challenging call, Flora gave birth to their fifth child, Bonnie Amison Benson, on March 30, 1940. 
When the United States entered World War II at the end of 1941, Ezra's workload both at the office and in the church increased. During the war years, Ezra was one of four men appointed to a special agricultural advisory committee that met monthly with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. During this time of national crisis and restructuring, a colleague, Judge Miller, spoke of Ezra's efforts. Ezra's cool head had as much to do with keeping our food lines flowing during World War II as that of any other person in America. The Idaho farm boy, Ezra Taft Benson, had earned respect among work associates and church members from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. But the Lord had still more in mind for this hard-working man. After nearly four years of diligent labor at both the NCFC and the Washington, D.C. stake offices, two rather lucrative job offers came to Ezra. In need of guidance, Ezra arranged a stop in Salt Lake City on his next business trip out west. He took his 15-year-old son, Reed, with him as a reward for earning his Eagle Scout Award. Arriving in Salt Lake on July 15, 1943, Ezra first had a sweet reunion with President McKay. Then he and Reed traveled to southern Idaho for a long-awaited visit with family and friends. When they returned to Salt Lake on July 26th, however, they found that President McKay's office had frantically been trying to reach Ezra. President Heber J. Grant wanted to see Ezra in his summer home in Emigration Canyon. Ezra explained that his train would be leaving shortly and he would not have time to make the detour. Upon learning that President Grant's home was only a few minutes away, however, Ezra quickly agreed to go, and he and Reed were driven there. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you. Dad had promised we boys that he'd take us on one of his farm trips as soon as we got our Eagle Scout. And I, being the oldest, uh, went first. And we came through various western states and finally into Utah. And he wanted to ask his old mission president, now in the first presidency, President David O. McKay, a certain question before he could. President McKay says, Heber J. Grant's in his summer cabin and wants to see you. So we were driven up there, and as he went into the cabin, I waited outside. And I got the distinct impression he's being called to the Quorum of the Twelve. And that's exactly what happened. He's lying on the bed and asked me to pull a chair out close to him, which I did. He took both my hands in his. He says, Brother Benson, with all my heart, I congratulate you. You have been called as the youngest apostle in the church. And uh, I don't know that we said much more. I cried and he cried. And the spirit was there. As I had never felt it before in my life. Understandably, Ezra was shocked by this prophetic pronouncement. He later recorded his feelings. I felt so utterly weak and unworthy that his words of comfort and reassurance which followed were doubly appreciated. Among other things, he stated, the Lord has a way of magnifying men who are called to positions of leadership. Ezra was sustained as a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles at the 1943 October General Conference, along with Elder Spencer W. Kimball, who had also been recently called as an apostle. When asked to address the congregation, Elder Benson spoke with humble emotion. I am grateful beyond my power of expression for the great honor that has come to one of the weakest of your number. I love this work. All my life I have had a testimony of it. Is that the gospel is true. Following this momentous occasion, Ezra returned to Washington, D.C., where for a time he resumed his efforts with the NCFC and the Washington, D.C. stake. 
By the spring the following year, Elder Benson was able to transition a replacement into his position at work and bid a tearful goodbye to the stake membership that he loved so dearly. On August 12, 1944, shortly after arriving back in Salt Lake City, the Bensons were blessed with the arrival of Flora Beth, their fourth daughter and last child. Now that he was back in Salt Lake City, Elder Benson entered into full-time church service with excitement and energy. In May of 1945, President Heber J. Grant crossed through the veil, and the prophetic mantle passed to his faithful successor, George Albert Smith. In February of 1946, shortly after the end of World War II, Elder Benson was called by President Smith as the new European Mission President. In this calling, Ezra was charged with reopening the missionary effort in Europe and with aiding the suffering saints in the war-ravaged nations. And because of the chaotic status of Europe at that time, Elder Benson was unable to take his family members with him. President Benson was called to go to Europe and reopen the missions, even though he was the youngest member of the Council of Twelve, being only 46 years of age, and he had a small family of six children who were at home during this whole time. President Benson did not take no for an answer. He felt like he was on the Lord's errand, and he frequently quoted the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord talks about his servants being on the Lord's errand, and then the statement, and none shall stay them. When President Benson went to Europe, the missions of the church were in a sad condition as a result of the war. Many of the saints lost their possessions. Many were poor, hungry, and many had little clothing but what they had on their backs. The church organizations who were somewhat weak, they didn't have lesson material or the other kinds of information they needed to uh, conduct the affairs of the missions. Elder Benson and his secretary, Fred Babel, began their work in Europe by establishing a new mission headquarters in London. Following this, they traveled to each nation to assess the membership's needs. By the time World War II was over, we had thousands of Latter-day Saints all over Europe on the verge of starvation. And the church sent, if I recall correctly, about 92 carloads of food and clothing and sent Ezra Taft Benson over to Europe to get as much of it spread out among the saints as possible. This program the Lord had set up, welfare program, so to speak, would save hundreds and hundreds of lives. And as Ezra Taft Benson went out among them and saw what terrible things had happened to them and the abuse that some of the women had put up with, he became a hero in the minds of thousands of the saints in Europe. In Germany, Elder Benson helped to organize refugee camps near Berlin and Frankfurt, where welfare supplies were distributed to many saints left homeless as a result of the war. After great difficulty, Elder Benson and Fred Babel were finally able to obtain permission to enter Poland. Following even more trying negotiations, they acquired a jeep and began scouring the shattered nation in search of missing saints. Ezra's heart ached as he made his way through the rubble of what was for a time the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw. He wrote of this experience. As one walks through the city, the most sickening odors meet you from debris, dead bodies in the ruins and filth. One feels so helpless amidst it all that you find yourself wanting to leave or shut yourself from it in your room. In addition to providing thousands of European saints with food and supplies, Elder Benson organized branches, established meeting facilities, and distributed scriptures and church literature. After months of tireless work, Ezra was released from his duties with the European Mission in November of 1946. In 10 months' time, he had traveled over 60,000 miles by plane, train, car, and jeep to comfort his suffering fellow saints.
he had re-established most of the European missions, dedicated Finland for the preaching of the gospel, and had facilitated the distribution of food and other welfare supplies. Returning to the United States, Elder Benson rejoiced to be reunited with his family. And before long, he was once again hard at work, traveling among the saints, preaching the gospel and strengthening the members. In his October 1948 General Conference address, Elder Benson reflected. The saints there taught me a deeper appreciation for testimony. This thing that provides an anchor during times of great trial and hardship. I saw people peacefully happy in their hearts while standing amidst ruins all around them. People bore testimony to the goodness of the Lord, although they were the sole remaining member of a once prosperous and happy family. I came to know that those who have a testimony of this work can endure anything which they may be called upon to endure and still keep sweet in spirit. In November 1952, word reached Elder Benson that he was being considered by President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower to serve on his cabinet as the Secretary of Agriculture. Confirming the news, Elder Benson spoke with President David O. McKay, who had succeeded President Smith upon his passing in 1951. President McKay felt that if Elder Benson were offered the position, he should accept it. In the coming days, Elder Benson was indeed approached by President-elect Eisenhower about filling the cabinet position. After he and Flora fasted and prayed concerning the matter, Ezra agreed to join the Eisenhower administration for at least two years, becoming the first religious leader in the cabinet in over a century. Elder Benson was now also Secretary Benson. He found himself leading a department of nearly 78,000 employees who addressed the food needs of the more than 160 million people in America. His department budget for the year was $2.1 billion. Ezra moved to Washington, D.C. in January of 1953, where for the first six months he lived by himself until the family could be brought out to join him. Recalling his first few days alone as the Secretary of Agriculture, Elder Benson wrote, For the first time, it was suddenly more than I could bear. The job ahead seemed too big, the load too heavy, the loneliness too sharp a pain. I broke down and wept aloud. I was with Dad when he was sworn in as Secretary of Agriculture, and Eisenhower said, Welcome to a tough job. It was tough, sometimes referred to as the hot sea in Washington with farm prices going down, surpluses building up. One of the cabinet members said to my father one time, Ezra, when I say my prayers at night, I thank the Lord I'm not the Secretary of Agriculture. But with God's help and his Stanford principle, he felt more concerned about the next generation than he did the next election. He became known as a man of integrity. Retaining his calling as a member of the Twelve Apostles during his time in government, Elder Benson found frequent opportunities to share his faith and the virtues of the church with leaders across the nation and around the world. After a little more than a year in office, Secretary Benson was selected for a television profile on Edward R. Murrow's weekly program, Person to Person. The nationwide broadcast took viewers into the Benson's home as they held a typical Latter-day Saint family home evening. And according to the program staff, the episode received more fan mail than any other episode Murrow hosted. In 1955, while he was on USDA business in Europe, Ezra was able to attend the dedication of the Swiss Temple. He was grateful to see the improvements and advances that had taken place in Europe since he was last there just after the war. Throughout all his travels worldwide, Elder Benson visited with church members and missionaries wherever possible. President Benson 
was more groomed for his day than any other prophet, with the exception of Joseph Smith. He was groomed in foreign affairs and in the workings of government, and he knew all of the frailties of the governmental workings. He always had the promptings of the spirit and knew what to do. Even the president of the United States took his advice the secretary instituted the practice of having daily prayer for his staff. Each member of the staff took turns saying the prayer for a staff meeting. He suggested to President Eisenhower that it would be nice if they had prayer in cabinet meeting. The president agreed. President Benson said the prayer. The next cabinet meeting, it was not there, so the secretary went back to the president again and reminded him uh, that uh, that would be a good idea, and from then on, it was an established uh, procedure that they have prayer at uh, the cabinet meetings. Ezra originally committed two years to President Eisenhower. Critics wondered if he would last even that long. However, he remained Secretary of Agriculture for the entire eight years of Eisenhower's administration. The only other cabinet member to serve as long was the Postmaster General. In 1961, Elder Benson returned to his full-time activities as an Apostle of the Lord. Needless to say, President McKay and the Twelve were glad to have him back. President N. Eldon Tanner, second counselor in the First Presidency, commented, I really know of no more courageous and capable proponent of any cause which he thinks is right than Brother Ezra Taft Benson. In the latter part of 1963, President McKay called Ezra to serve a second time as the president of the European mission. And of course, he eagerly accepted. On New Year's Day, 1964, Elder Vincent arrived at the mission headquarters in Frankfurt, Germany. In this assignment, President Benson held direct stewardship over four stakes and 12 missions composed of nearly 1,500 missionaries and 45,000 saints. It was a privilege to work with President Benson during this time when he was in Europe. Because of his stature in the Eisenhower administration, he was able to open up new doors and strengthen the image of the church throughout the countries of Europe, building the stakes and the missions. In some of the countries of Europe, notably Switzerland, the church was not recognized officially by government as a church. They were more of a sect or had a club status. He worked with state officials, state department officials, making contacts with religious leaders and government leaders to open up new doors so that the church would be better recognized in Europe. I recall that there were meetings held in the European Mission Home to have a uniform and systematic way to translate literature and information from the church for the publications in the various countries of Europe. And I think he streamlined that process a great deal. Meeting on several occasions with government officials in Italy, Elder Benson was able to reopen the work there in 1965. It was a monumental accomplishment as missionaries had been absent in Italy for more than a century. Following another successful tenure abroad, Elder Benson was called back to Salt Lake in the fall of 1965. Throughout the remainder of the 1960s, Ezra became a champion of freedom, often addressing the topic in his talks and speeches. Speaking requests from all over the nation poured in, in such volume that he was able to accept fewer than 5% of them. From 1968 to 1970, Ezra served as the supervisor of the missionary effort in Asia, with Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the 70 as his assistant. He made several trips to this dangerous area during the Vietnam War era. And despite the conflict in the region, he was able to dedicate Singapore and Indonesia for the preaching of the gospel. In 1970, Elder Benson was saddened by the passing of his dear friend and prophet, President David O. McKay, who shared his great passion for freedom. The following year, President McKay's successor, Joseph Fielding Smith, designated Elder Benson to represent the church at the 2500th anniversary of the founding of the Persian Empire in Iran. In the summer of 1972, 
President Smith passed away just two weeks short of his 96th birthday. Just 18 months later, on December 26, 1973, President Smith's successor, Harold B. Lee, also passed away. Following the death of President Lee, Spencer W. Kimball was sustained as the president of the church, and Ezra Taft Benson was named the new president of the Twelve. Despite the fact that he was in his 70s, the new quorum president tackled this assignment with the same verve he had shown as a boy on the farm. During his 10 plus years as president of the 12, Ezra circled the globe, visiting and uplifting members of the ever-expanding Latter-day Kingdom. In 1978, President Benson suffered a temporary physical setback. At a retreat in Midway, while helping a friend climb on a horse, the animal reared up, knocking him to the ground. Ezra's hip was fractured in several places. After surgery in Salt Lake City, it was determined that all would heal well, but the recovery time took several months. He and Flora spent the rehabilitation period with their daughter Beth, whose husband David was recovering from a recent back surgery. In 1984, President Benson commented on the love and respect found among his brethren of the Twelve. I think there is no group of men in this world who are closer to each other than the Council of the Twelve. I don't believe there is a man in that Council who would not lay down his life for any of the others. On November 5th, 1985, President Spencer W. Kimball passed away. That night, Ezra described his feelings in his journal. I have never felt weaker, and never before have I felt the influence of the Spirit in such great strength. May the good Lord sustain me as I go forward humbly. I think it can be truthfully said, I will never acknowledge the Lord's hand as I have the last few hours. On November 10th, 1985, the apostles gathered in the Salt Lake Temple to reorganize the First Presidency. There, Ezra Taft Benson was sustained and set apart as the 13th President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He selected elders Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson to serve as his counselors. My dear father was 86 years old at the time he became president of the church. He was the second oldest apostle to do so. Only Joseph Fielding Smith, who was 93 when he became president, was older. Our family was living in the Washington, D.C. area at the time that President Kimball passed away. And on the morning that the 12 apostles were to meet in the temple to reorganize the first presidency, my mom wanted to call her father to let him know that we'd be fasting and praying for him that day. And uh, when she called his apartment in Salt Lake City, a young man answered the phone. And she naturally assumed that her call had been routed through a church security officer. And so my mother said, this is Beverly Parker calling. Uh, can I please speak to my father? And the young voice on the other end of the line said, this is your father. And in the days and weeks following that, it was obvious to us as we watched him walk and talk that somehow the Lord had turned back the clock and added years to his life. And it was a testimony to us that truly the, the mantle of the Lord had fallen upon him and that the Lord was strengthening him for this new responsibility. At a press conference held on November 11th, President Benson read a prepared statement which emphasized three points. The threefold mission of the church as outlined by President Kimball, his love for all humankind, and his testimony of the Savior and his restored gospel. And the new prophet further stated, I love all our Father's children of every color, creed, and political persuasion. My only desire is to serve as the Lord would have me do. However, the true thrust of his presidency began two months later 
as he addressed the members of the Annandale, Virginia stake outside Washington, D.C., with a sermon on the Book of Mormon. For the next three years, President Benson, in his travels throughout the stakes and from the pulpit of the tabernacle, would turn time and time again to the importance of daily reading and studying the Book of Mormon, even bestowing a powerful blessing upon those who do. I bless you with increased power to do good and to resist evil. I bless you with increased understanding of the Book of Mormon. I promise you that from this moment forward, if we will daily sup from its pages and abide by its precepts, God will pour out upon each child of Zion and the church a blessing hitherto unknown. It seemed like before Grandpa Benson became the prophet, he spoke so much about anti-communism. And it was like when he became the prophet, he totally shifted. He knew where Heavenly Father wanted him to put his emphasis. He still felt as strongly about anti-communism, but he had this wonderful sense of responsibility about the Book of Mormon. He knew that was his mission. Ezra Taft Benson became president of the church. And I had asked him to give us one of those great talks on the Constitution, which he had given before. But this time he said, no, I have other things to do. And I don't have much time to do it. And so he began his great program of pushing the Book of Mormon. Now, the thing that concerned him was the Doctrine and Covenant statement that the whole church was under condemnation because they had taken lightly the revelations that were contained in in the Book of Mormon and some of the other scriptures, he found out that he could not pray the condemnation of the church away and that we wouldn't get the other two-thirds of the Book of Mormon. Imagine that. Only a third of the Book of Mormon had been translated. We couldn't get the other two-thirds until the whole church wanted it. True to their prophet's call, the members did flood the earth with this unique book of scripture. Since 1986, millions of copies of the Book of Mormon have been placed with investigators every year. Not only did President Benson counsel the saints in this, but he also practiced what he preached, making great efforts to place copies of the Book of Mormon with those he came in contact with. He met with President Reagan at the time. In fact, he presented President Reagan with a hymn book. He knew that President Reagan already had several copies of the Book of Mormon that he had given him. In fact, it's interesting to see the kings and presidents and leaders of industry and agriculture that received copies of the Book of Mormon from Grandpa through the years. And as we would go through his correspondence, we would see sometimes two or three letters from the same person saying, thank you for the copy of the Book of Mormon. So pretty soon he'd start sending hymn books. President Benson also made great efforts to speak to all the groups within the church, from the youth to the elderly, to the single members, new converts, the faithful, and to those who had gone astray. Unfortunately, failing health soon slowed the efforts of the active prophet. Several minor incidents with President Benson's heart led doctors to insert a pacemaker into his chest near the end of 1986. Just under a year later, he actually suffered a mild heart attack. Yet after a few months of recovery time, he was again traveling among the saints, attending the groundbreaking ceremony for the San Diego Temple on February 27, 1988. However, shortly after the 1988 October General Conference, President Benson suffered a stroke at the age of 89. It left him unable to speak personally in conference again. However, he continued to attend general conference until 1991. There, he listened intently as his written words were read to the conference by his loving counselors. I remember when Grandpa was very sick, and he had so much support and so much help, and people praying for him and fasting for him, and, and he kept rallying around and hanging in there. And I think sometimes the Lord wanted us to be faithful and endure and and to put our faith and our trust in him because he was weak and he was old but he was still able when the first presidency needed to meet and decide on issues they said he could speak and he could say yes or no to certain important decisions 
Dad was a great champion of freedom. He was a great freedom fighter himself. And he was delighted to see the doors open for future missionary work in countries that had been closed before. The man who built the Berlin Wall passed away the same day my father passed away. Because of my father's high position in government, it opened many doors for missionary work. Uh, out of respect for him, uh, there were barriers that came down and helped us move the gospel in a more successful manner. Under President Benson's direction, eight new missions were opened in the former Soviet Union. And new missions were also created in the reunified Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Bulgaria. I don't think it was um, an accident that he was president of the church during the uh, bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution. And he gave a talk at the Marriott Center titled The Constitution, A Heavenly Banner. It had been pre-printed in little booklet form, and the BYU bookstore was stocked with them, and it immediately sold out. It was put into the congressional record by a senator who's not of our faith. It was distributed to every member of Congress, to every senator, every uh, representative, to the White House staff. It had wide distribution uh, inside the kingdom and outside the kingdom. Unfortunately, not all of President Benson's experiences as the prophet were joyful. On August 14, 1992, he was separated for a time from his sweet wife and beloved companion as she slipped quietly through the veil. For 66 years, Flora Amason Benson had stood beside Ezra as his eternal companion, the mother of their children, as his partner in positions of leadership, and most of all, as his best friend. There is no doubt that his feelings of loss and sadness were tremendous. As evidence of his true love and respect, President Benson made one of his final public appearances at Flora's funeral in the assembly hall on August 19, 1992. The aging prophet then spent the majority of his last two years in his Salt Lake City apartment, as well as in the homes of his children. He was visited regularly by his children and grandchildren, as well as his counselors and the Twelve Apostles. He was called one evening by his granddaughter, Flora McConkie. At this time, I was married and living in um, Texas. And we, as we frequently did, called him on a Sunday evening just to express our love for him. And, and I frequently would sing to him over the phone, How Great Thou Art, and usually just the first verse. But on that occasion, I sang the first and the fourth, which ends with, When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Uh, and the next day, he was called home. And so that was a tender experience to sing that to him on the eve of his passing. On May 30th, Memorial Day of 1994, President Ezra Taft Benson passed peacefully through the veil of mortality. Following the funeral services in the Salt Lake Tabernacle, the black hearse carrying the prophet's casket made its way north on Interstate 15, followed by the vehicles of family, friends, and fellow church leaders. The hearse made its journey through streets lined with thousands of mourners to the quiet town of Whitney, Idaho. Here, in the place of his birth, President Benson was laid to rest at the side of his dear Flora. From Mormon boy to Mormon prophet, this humble farmer from Idaho had certainly achieved greatness. His example as a dedicated husband and compassionate father was witnessed by millions across the world both in and out of the church. His great patriotism and love of farming could be questioned by none. And as this simple farm boy traveled the globe, none would ever doubt his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the restoration of the gospel. For his life had made evident the fact that he was truly a modern prophet of God. age 
Got the old man wagon from the field, just like you asked me to. They never use it. Quick then, we ain't got much time. 